there. Uh, so, wanted to let you guys know, today we're doing something a little bit special. Uh, for a long time, I have listened to NPR on my breaks. NPR, for our European or global friends, is the national public radio here in the United States. Now, when I go out to lunch, I frequently get to hear the show 1A, which is a show produced out of WAMU. And it is a show hosted by Joshua Johnson. They cover all sorts of different things. Um, but what they did last week was a very interesting line of shows on gaming and streaming. So I contacted them just in the off chance to see if they'd like to talk about Twitch and what we do here. And although they didn't have any spaces in game week, they said, you know what? Would you like to talk to Josh about the week about gaming and all sorts of fun things? So today that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's go ahead, switch over and let's get started talking to Joshua Johnson from 1A. Pretty great. So. To start with, hello everybody. Welcome to our interview with Joshua Johnson, host of the radio show 1A. Today we're going to be talking about his game mode and cons uh, game mode consoles and community week, which was the theme of last week's broadcasts. In these shows, you can find discussion on live streaming, its impacts on community, loot box discussion, creator interviews, and much more. All these shows are available in the archive over at the the number one a dot org. If you'd like to take a look. That being said, let's get right into the show today. Learn about how this week was created talk about gaming and really all that fun stuff. So without further delay, Joshua, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for making time for us. Oh, it is my absolute pleasure. Uh, so uh, Joshua, if you'd like, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and your show 1A? Well, I am the host of 1A, which is produced by WAMU, which is the NPR news station in Washington, and it's distributed by NPR. We are five days a week talking about a little bit of everything, gaming, of course, uh, and as a special series that we just did, but we cover politics and pop culture and news and sports and education and, and health and international stories and national stories. We travel all over the country and take the show on the road. And every Friday we do a roundup of the week's top stories. We do an international hour and a national hour. All of it is streamed online at the 1a.org. And we're just trying to create a place for the country to have meaningful, worthwhile, and connective conversations, which kind of seems to be hard to come by these days. So we do a little bit of a lot of things, but mostly our job is to have interesting conversations and get the nation talking to itself. Excellent. Also, I want to personally thank you for somebody who has about an hour to listen to the radio each day. That Friday news roundup is kind of uh, very important for many of us. <laughs> so thank you for it. <laughs> yeah, it's one of our more popular days of the week for that very reason. There's so much information out there online that it can be hard to figure out what to pay attention to, what things mean, even just to have a place to get basic questions about the week's top stories answered. So we try to do a little bit of a lot of that every Friday. Very cool. Very cool. So you just recently had this very interesting week, uh, Game Mode, uh, which really went into all sorts of different things pertaining to gaming from the business side to the gaming side, to the people that make it, to the people who play it. So as we start this discussion, let's let's go right to the very beginning. What was the first game that you played? And was this the first game that really got you into gaming? Or how, how did that work? The first game I ever played was probably something on an Apple IIe computer, which for those of you who are too young to remember when monitors didn't have color and such, it was a monochrome green computer monitor. Apple IIe used five and a quarter inch floppy disks. When you turn it on, it was a switch that actually went click and you could hear it turn on <laughs> and you could hear like the lead components and the mouse inside of a wheel spinning the, the hard drive up. And it was probably any nice. number of games like Hangman, uh, I remember somebody found a strip poker game and that was the most illicit thing I had ever seen as a little kid. But it was it was one of those systems where you could play different games, but a game was a discrete experience where you had to put it in, turn the computer on, boot the whole thing up, play, finish, stop, turn it off, remove the disc, put a new disc in, turn it on again. And it was kind of at the beginning of the era when like the Commodore 64 and the Atari and the ColecoVision, like other systems made games, a discrete one game experience, almost like going to a movie theater and having to sit in one cinema, watch a movie, get up, leave, buy another ticket, sit in another one, watch, get up, leave before you could kind of shift from game to game. So a game was an experience. It was like something you blocked off time for and you made a discrete decision like this is what I'm going to do 
right now because if if it's not worth my time i'm already deep in the game so i might as well finish it <laughs> yeah a process by the way full disclosure uh for the entire second half of your answer there i was trying to envision what a strip poker game would look like on an apple 2e so thank you for that something to look into later um <laughs> not very sexy i gotta say you know when when a body is in kind of like dot matrix pixelation basically it, you you can't really see much i was like i I think that's supposed to be a nipple, but I'm not really, I'm not titillated. I'm sorry, this doesn't do a thing for, I guess this is dirty, click. And I would turn it off and then the mouse would stop running in its wheel and I would play, play some. I, I believe I'm aroused. Um. <laughs> yeah, and if you have to ask yourself if you are, you're not, really. It's just not, it's not that good. True story, true story. So going into our next question, how has gaming had an impact on your life, if at all? Uh, has it been something that you've kind of done to pass time or has it been something more? Well, gaming for me was one of those pop culture cornerstones that we take for granted now. But at the time when I was growing up, I was born in 1980. So when I was coming up, gaming was a really fairly new phenomenon. We weren't that far out from, you know, Nolan Bushnell putting the first Pong machine in a bar in Sunnyvale, California, and people packing it with so many quarters that you couldn't jam anymore in. So video games were this new thing that weren't just fun, but they were social and connective in a way the world had never seen. But at the same time, we also had the rise of cable television. So at the same time as we had video games happening, we had MTV that went on the air in 1981, BET that went on the air, CNN. And we're beginning to see all kinds of different media used to connect people in much more discreet ways. The Sony Walkman was a big deal. We were about to have CDs hit the scene. So there was all of this, this new fusion of technology and culture and social connection that kind of blew up the way that we interacted with, with one another. You had music formats that were more discreet. So urban radio, hip hop radio was a new thing, which changed the way that people listened to music. You know, the Arsenio Hall show went on the air in the late 80s. So that changed the way that people looked at culture on television. And so video gaming kind of intersected with this moment in pop culture where people said, it's so, I, I don't have to just take what the mainstream gives. It's so much easier now for me to geek out on the things that I am interested in. And by the end of that, decade you began to have people who learned how to use you know the first Macs and early versions of Windows where they could create their own images and content and magazines and so on it was it was part of this larger explosion of discrete geek culture and also creative culture where people could kind of hack popular culture for themselves Oh, great answer and also and, and just to kind of also go into some of the stuff you discussed last week that I loved hearing I'm I'm so used to the stigma of gaming, of people alone, kind of enjoying them themselves. And a lot of folks just don't seem to understand how they're actually just gateways into these larger communities that have existed for years in different mediums and different forms. And they're just kind of collaborating and coming together under these different umbrellas. So it was so great to hear last week as you guys really kind of delved into that and talked about how there's actually a lot of connectivity in these hobbies that sometimes come off as solo adventures. Well, and there always has been. I mean, you know, I, I think back to the movie Tron, the original, you know, with Bruce Boxleitner and Jeff Bridges and, and the way that it depicted video gaming kind of split the difference between the way that people have kind of viewed games for a while. You know, you have all the people in Flynn's, like playing video games very collectively all together, watching Flynn, you know, win at Space Paranoids. But then you also have Flynn by himself coding the game and getting sucked into the game alone. That's a very important image because when he gets pulled into the game grid, he's sitting by himself. And because he's alone, he can get sucked in. So there was something cultural about this idea of video games being both something that kids did that their parents didn't really understand or that grownups did that kind of infantilized them. And also being this thing where if you gave it too much of your time and attention and money, frankly, you would get sucked in in a way that people could relate to, people couldn't pull you out of. It, the stereotypes kind of always been been there, and it's always been kind of true and not true at the same time. And because everyone's experience with gaming is so bespoke, it's easy to say, well, of course, that's the way gaming is. 
And it's easy to say, well, of course, that's not the way gaming is. I mean, both have always kind of existed and we've never really resolved the debate. But I guarantee you, every single one of the parents today who is worried about their kids getting sucked into games plays Candy Crush or Words with Friends. So they don't really <laughs> have a leg to stand on. For sure, for sure. And yeah, the multifacetedness of the entire situation when perspectives are involved, there's so many different ways to look at it that it's almost like they're all kind of right in their own ways. But at the same time, sometimes you can take such a strict perspective that you don't even realize how much more there is to the other ones. But yeah, fantastic right. point. Remember, I love that this, point this, about this, Tron also. That, that's interesting. Yeah, and this was, this was also, remember, this was not too long before people started worrying about the content of pop music, you know, whether it was Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister testifying before Congress or, you know, Al Gore and Tipper Gore advocating a parental advisory explicit lyrics label. Like there was, there was a mainstream debate about what we do with video games and, you know, hip hop music and, and you know, metal and all these other cultural explosions that were happening to try to give parents more control and more awareness of what their kids were doing. So the fear, I think, came from a legit place of parents like, well, we don't know what this is and we have to protect our kids. But the fear quickly metastasizes into, into stereotypes. And that's kind of where we run into trouble. For sure, that fear of the unknown that I think is every parent's fear. I'm a new parent myself and, and even I'm trying, trying to have some trouble manipulating this mobile game atmosphere that I didn't grow up in myself. <laughs> Because, I mean, I, I was all prepared. You know, I've got the Nintendo Classic and the Super Nintendo Classic and my roadmap of how I'm going to introduce my kids to video games. And then here come these mobile games out of left field. And it's it throws everything for a loop. And here I am thinking I'm totally prepared, completely unprepared, just like you're saying, with that kind of fear of the unknown and how I should approach it and everything. But thankfully, we have places we can educate ourselves these days. So hopefully be a little right. bit more ready for that. Right, exactly. Those kids in their darn mobile <laughs> games screwing up everything we thought we knew. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so going back to the games here, what games, if any, are you currently playing? I heard you mention some during game uh, game mode, but I wanted to know, like, what games are you playing these days? How often do you play? What, and what's your favorite game in recent memory and why? Yeah, I don't I don't play nearly as often as I'd like. You know, 1A keeps me crazy busy. It's a, I it's can a imagine. <laughs> seven day a week job, pretty much. And I'm also an NBC News contributor. So I'll occasionally appear on Meet the Press or MSNBC, and so and we travel a great deal. So, gaming is kind of a, a a thing that I often do on my phone. Like, there'll be days where I can't have time, I can't make enough time to like sit in front of my PlayStation. I have a PlayStation Four Pro and a PlayStation VR, and I don't have as much time as I'd like to do it. So I'll just grab my phone and play Angry Birds Two for like fifteen minutes, and that just kind of scratches the itch for a little while, just to kind of have a brain break where I'm just not being productive, which is lovely. But for <laughs> the PlayStation 4, I, I kind of, I bought it early when I got the job, this job, because I said I need some kind of a break and I need some kind of a reward for getting to finally host a national news program. And so I dropped the money and it was, it was this luxury that I knew I wanted because I knew I was gonna need a break from the news cycle <laughs> and I was right. So initially it was about playing PlayStation VR, which I know people have issues with it, but I, I thought it was good. It's a good entry level VR setup. It's not an Oculus, but you know, yeah, you know, everyone can't you know be uber gamer and I just wanted something entry level. The so easiest I played to that. use by far. Right, and it's- In a beautiful you know, way. Yeah, you plug it in, you turn it on, you kind of you do everything you need to do with it. And once I played the the VR experience at Star Wars Battlefront, the first one where you're flying an X-Wing, I was like, this is the best thing ever. And so I was hooked. But after that, I kind of was able to only get into games every now and then. Um, I don't do blood and gore very well. I'm fairly squeamish with with blood and gore. So there's a and lot these of these days. It's about I'm as realistic out. as you can get. <laughs> yeah. So like MK 11 is out. I was sitting with a friend of mine as he was playing and trying to master some move. And I'm like, hey. Hey. he says, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> can I, Ugh. I gotta go. I just couldn't sit through it. It was not going to happen, but there are certain games where they have, you know, say a setting where you can decrease the gore. And so that works for me. So I've had fun playing Destiny 2, playing Warframe. You know, the free-to-play games were kind of new to me for a long time. I knew about them, but I never, like, made time to play them until recently. And I was like, I need to know what this is. Also, partly because we talk about gaming on 1A. And so it gave me more of a reason to want to plug into those aspects of pop culture that I wasn't aware of. Like, it gave me a reason to try 
playing Fortnite, for example, because I was like, well, everyone's talking about it. Sooner or later, we're going to do a show on it. Let me give this a shot. And so that's kind of gotten me into playing some. The, the games that I tend to have played the most recently, uh, there's a puzzle game called Darknet, which I enjoy a great deal. It's one of these where I can spend like 30 to 35 minutes hacking one big puzzle and either succeed or kick myself because I have failed utterly. <laughs> uh, the the Spider-Man game that came out for the PlayStation. Oh, yes. is, I love that game. I sat down one Friday at two and kind of came to around 1130. I was like, I have to go to bed. And then I put the game down and fell asleep, woke up the next day and did the exact same thing. Um, I Welcome to my through... life, Joshua. <laughs> I know, I know. I recently played through a game called Observation on the PlayStation, yes. which is kind of a, a story on rails, but it's basically a sci-fi movie that you play through. But it was really evocative and interesting and kind of like it hooked me. Uh, Detroit Become Human was a game that I told the team about that was one of the first games we talked about in terms of a show topic because we did a, a show last year, I think it was, or earlier this year, about the art of video games. And Detroit Become Human is one of those where you had like Jesse Washington and Clancy Brown and all these other actors who were wireframed for it. And it really has this uber cinematic feel. And I thought, you know, this is something that we should be able to talk about as an art form, as opposed to just like a piece of pop culture that the kids play with. So it, it kind of varies. If I've had a, a bad day and I just need to like shoot things, I will boot up Warframe or Destiny 2 and have my catharsis. But, you know, otherwise, give me 10 minutes of Angry Birds and I'm good. So we have about 5,000 people watching us right now. And I just wanted you to know cool. that the second you mentioned Warframe, chat erupted. That is, I'm a Warframe partner. Uh, I, I love that oh. game. Fantastic. So that's, it's very cool to hear. Do you have a favorite frame? Yeah. And I, I like Warframe. I mean, I granted, I'm not one of the most like elite elite players of Warframe just cause you know, it's hard for me to make time to like really dig in and, and play as, as aggressively as I like game. to, but you know, oh. I've, I've made my way through a few planets. I'm trying to get from Mars to Phobos. I cannot kill that guardian. It is making me crazy. Uh, I hatched a Kubro, which is pretty cool. And I have not been able to like get one of those cool modified ships that flies in when you make a mission. I am not that cool, but I do enjoy playing to an extent. I don't do a lot of the multiplayer online because I am pure cannon fodder. So usually I'll pick the missions that I can either play alone or with a party because I don't like being cannon fodder. And that's usually my, you know, my outlet for Warframe, but still like it's, 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 enough of a customized option that i don't feel purely loot boxed playing warframe you know like there's enough of the game where i can enjoy it and get what i need out of it when i need it and then you know feel satisfied absolutely well open invitation if you ever want to jump in i'd, I'd be happy to play with you <laughs> we I, i've about 500 hours in that game right now absolutely love it see see you say that now <laughs> I am way better at hosting this show than I am at playing. Like if I, I am like a PhD at hosting this show, I might be a remedial kindergartner at Warframe by comparison to you. So hey, you're, hey, you're welcome to try to, to like, if you want charity hours, you're welcome to play with me. But otherwise I'm not sure that I'm going to help you with your missions. It might not work. I'm going to tell you a little secret here, but, but please don't tell anyone. I'm okay. not that good at games. It's okay. Shut the front door. I know. These people keep watching. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, so it's very clear that you have a, a true zeal for gaming. Like just, just what you named there. That's fantastic. Also, quick side note, by the way, the main uh, droid in Detroit Become Human, Brian Descartes, he's actually a streamer on Twitch. Great guy. You should check him out sometime. Oh, really? Yeah, he's, he's a fantastic dude. Oh, cool. um, so you clearly have the zeal for gaming and you clearly are very good at what you do on 1A. So what I'd love to know is how did... How did this zeal for gaming kind of inspire game mode? How did, how did those two worlds collide? Well, there are several people on our team who are gamers. 1A's Paige Osborne produced the series. So we sent her to E3 out in LA last month to collect sound and to really cover it. And we, we figured that because so much of what we're open to doing on the show deals very squarely with pop culture, games are perfectly in line. And, you know, Paige is a gamer, I'm a gamer. And so it was kind of easy for us to start having those conversations. When we did the first show on gaming, which I think was the one about the art of video games, the response was just volcanic from the audience. It's one of those things we've noticed with a number of topics that we've done where 
if we touch on something that hits a vein, we'll get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments from people, many of which say, oh my God, I'm so glad you did this show. I'm so glad that you see us. And it validated that there is this community out there that listens to public radio, that listens to NPR, that is smart and engaged and thoughtful and has stories to tell, but isn't validated in feeling like this thing that's so important to them is worth a national discussion on an intelligent level. It's great that there are so many people, say, on Twitch and on YouTube and elsewhere who kind of get into the fun aspects of gaming, you know, playing along and, you know, all the kind of fun craziness that gaming involves. Our concern was that that was all the nation saw, and they didn't know that there were other things about gaming that were not purely fun and games, that this is an industry, that this is a culture, that this affects people's lives in a larger way. So once we did that, it was obvious. Like People were like, oh, you got to talk about this, you got to talk about that. And the ideas for what became game mode just flowed. By the way, we still want ideas because we want to keep doing more shows on gaming. So if you go to the one a.org slash game mode, you can see the shows we've done at the top of the page. There's a tab that says ask one a, which has all the information on how to suggest show ideas. And so we still want to, we want to do more of them. I remember I had a conversation with the CEO of NPR, Jarl Mohn, who's the outgoing CEO. He and I had dinner one night and I told him about the shows we did on gaming. This is before game mode. And he was like, oh, how did that go? And I was like, dude, the response was ridiculous. Like we, we had way more comments than we could use. And he said, really? I said, yeah, yeah. People want to talk about gaming. He was like, hmm, that's interesting. I said, you have no idea how much this intersects with the lives of all kinds of people. I mean, the industry's own statistics show there are more 30 something women who are gamers than there are teenage boys in this country. There are more adults in this cohort than we acknowledge. Not and I told him, I was like, I'm amazed that NPR doesn't have a full-time gaming correspondent because you're leaving money on the table. And he went, hmm. and I could see gears starting to turn. <laughs> but it was, it was pretty easy once we did the first show. I mean, it was we didn't intend it as a proof of concept, but it was because the audience was like, if you do more of these, we will show up. And they have shown up. How cool. Uh, I mean, yeah. And again, listening to these shows over the course of last week, and, and I can't recommend these enough. If you have any time, hit that website, the one a.org, download all these. They're phenomenal listens, especially as they move through the week and you get the loot boxes and game development and all sorts of stuff. Extremely interesting. So tell me, Joshua, now, now that the week has wrapped up a little bit, what were your highlights during game mode? Was there anything that you learned that, that really kind of took you off guard or surprised you? Well, I think one of the big highlights, well, one of them for sure was being able to just bring back coverage of E3 and let people in our audience who weren't super steeped in gaming just hear the industry perspective. We also had interviews with people who work in gaming. We had an interview with the guy who writes scripts for video games, with someone who composes music, with someone who is a full-time Twitch streamer, who's a cosplayer, just to kind of get at some of the more fun aspects of the jobs around the industry. It was great to be able to talk about the business aspect of games in the third show we did, which was about this culture of, of crunch in terms of working 80, 90, 100 Very hour popular topic to get today. these games. Yeah, and we, we did an hour on that. We did a conversation about loot boxing and kind of the economics of gaming, including this proposed law from Congressman Josh Hawley of Missouri that would address loot boxes on a federal level. So it, 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 part of the highlight for me anyway was just seeing the audience's reaction and hearing about it when the topic was legitimized for them as a news topic, as a, as a, as a civic discussion, as opposed to as just that thing that geeks and gamers do, but rather something that is relevant to the country. I mean, video games, AAA games, and Hollywood blockbusters can cost the same amount of money to produce and can earn the same amount of money. And once you kind of clarify it to people in that way, their ears perk up. And there's so much more under the surface beyond that that it didn't take much validation. So I think my favorite part of it was just seeing people's eyes kind of open and go, oh, I, I never would have known about this, but for the series. And now they can take it seriously in a way that they probably never had exposure to. But that's the nice thing about our audience, about the public radio audience in general, is that they're exploratory and they're curious. And so if you can 
get into the hook of a story of like why it matters, they'll they'll come along for the ride. And they did. Very cool. Very cool. So in lack of a better way to describe this, you you are pretty woke when it comes to this. Um yeah. so I'm not in How do I? You know. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure if there were any, but did any of your personal views on any aspect of gaming change as as game mode has now concluded? Um, I, I mean, I, I do try to keep my my well, my political views for sure out of the show, but I think I try my best I, to. I <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, well, that's part of my you know responsibility as a, a host on on NPR. But I think a lot of what the show did was less about my views and more about the stories that we share. That's kind of the nice thing about 1A is that it's rooted in people's lived experiences. So there are shows, I mean, on this and on every topic where I'll come away from it thinking something different or feeling something different, but I'm prepped before I go in. So I kind of know where the show's gonna go before I go on the air. We, we kind of know the arc of the hour. I think it's more about people's lived experiences with gaming or education or health or a political controversy that's the most important part and that spares me to a large extent from having to bring my personal views into it at all sounds good um so going back to kind of uh your your gaming uh and what what you kind of do do you have a particular favorite genre of games that you play do you uh kind of like the violent games do you have any genres that that you just stay away from and also over the course of the games that you've played in your life has there ever been a standout or singular moment when you were playing a game that it may have impressed you on a way that it hadn't before or kind of shown you what games could mean as a medium? Hmm. Uh, in terms of a favorite genre, I don't think I have a favorite genre. I mean, you know, I played every Mario Brothers game coming up, so there's that. Uh, and maybe, well, actually, that's, I think that was one of my favorite moments is when Galaxy came out, the first Super Mario Galaxy. And the the game, I mean, it was such a phenomenally kind of groundbreaking game because of the the kind of three D you know environment and the way that you they, that you kind of had gravitation and you were aerodynamic in a way that, that Mario had never been. But even just the fact that it had a soundtrack that sounded so orchestral, I distinctly remember like the soundtracks of Gusty Garden Galaxy and Bowie Base Galaxy and the, you know the way that they just kind of soared that made the game feel like something else. I mean Mario has come a long way from da 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 da, da. <laughs> and that kind of hearing that made this thing that was this fun little playful game into an art form. And I think even you know Super Mario Galaxy, in, in terms of where it sat in the evolution of games, as far as I can remember, was one of the first games that had that kind of a big, full, orchestral, you know, non-computer generated soundtrack that really felt like, or that didn't sound computer generated, that felt like, you know, John Williams composed it. And it was one of the first games that I played where I was like, whoa, this is a very different, evocative, powerful art form. And from then on, it wasn't just entertainment. I think I looked at games with a more demanding eye after that, because once you know that games can do that, then that becomes the bar. And you have to go beyond that bar for the game to still kind of feel like it's worth your time and also your money. That's the other thing is because that was back before free to play games. You know, you put your money down for this game and the details like that make the game worth the money. You know what I'm saying? So it, it kind of raised the bar in terms of, okay, I don't just want this game for entertainment. I want this game for something aesthetic, that this has to be an artwork that someone put some love into. For sure, for sure. And yeah, it's kind of interesting that, that you would say that particular part about the music, because we've gone now from Super Mario Brother, MIDI style, you know, do 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 to you interviewing Ian Zur of all people <laughs> about the musical creations <laughs> that he's doing for these games. And now we have these entire orchestral just soundscapes that are being set up for these environments just to help with the immersive factor from the auditory side. It's, yeah, it's been incredible to see over the last few decades. That's for sure. 
Yeah, it's, and it's and it's also been fun. You mentioned I and Zer to interview people who are known in the gaming world. You know, we we had uh, Sonic Fox on the show, and you would have thought that we had booked an interview with the little baby Jesus because there were some folks who just kind of came out of their skin and were excited, regardless of what you think of Sonic Fox, that we kind of saw him and that we understood his value culturally and our audience who did not know about him kind of connected with the audience that did and understood the culture in a different way. So those kind of moments are fun too. Oh, for sure. I can only imagine. That, that is excellent. So going... Going back to some of the, the historical significance of gaming and kind of how it's evolved with culture, did, were you an arcade kid? Did you ever play in arcades growing up? Uh, did you engage in that culture? Or like oh, me, yeah. did you kind of mostly pass it by? Oh, no, no, I, I, was, I was a big arcade kid. Like, you know, I, I, would, I would burn up Chuck E. Cheese in a minute. I would spend all your money at Chuck E. Cheese and not on pizza, I'll tell you that. We used to have a place in, I'm from South Florida, I grew up in West Palm Beach, oh, cool. and there was a place in Boca Raton, I don't know if it's still there, called Wilt Chamberlain's. It was kind of like a Dave & Buster's before Dave & Buster's. It was this kind of basketball themed sports bar slash arcade. And we used to go there all the time and I would just <clears throat> stay there and play for hours and hours. Uh, GameWorks, there was a GameWorks years ago. I went to the University of Miami and, not, and just kind of just across the street from the southeastern corner of the main campus of Coral Gables, right in the city of South Miami, they built this big shopping center. Inside the shopping center was GameWorks. And so on Fridays, I would walk the length of the campus and then go to the shop at Sunset Place and go play uh, Dance Dance Revolution for a few hours against this, you know, this kid. He was this short kid named Jackson, little uh, Asian American kid. I think he went to UM, but he used to ace me every single time I played. I wish I had bought stock in the company that makes DDR because I would be <laughs> retired right now. I went every Thursday when I knew he was there and I played him constantly, very good naturedly until I finally started beating him. And then the following Thursday, he didn't show up. And I thought everything the light touches is my kingdom. So it's <laughs> satisfying for me. But yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed gaming a great deal. I liked, you know, the social piece of it. I enjoyed, you know, as the technology improved and the game experiences improved. And then they had kind of enclosed games like, you know, the Jurassic Park game and where you kind of are in a capsule and, you know, riding games that were like it's a motion simulator slash game. Watching the technology just evolve was was a lot of fun, but I, I still miss DDR. My knees do not, but I miss <laughs> the game. Very cool. Very cool. Speaking, and this actually perfect lead to my next question. Thank you for that. Um, so what are your thoughts on alternative ways to engage and play games? DDR with the dance pad, Wii motion controls, virtual reality, kind of like we said with the, with the PS4 Pro. Do you have any interest in, in these types of things? Have you had any that have been your favorite over time? Where do you think these are headed? Yeah, I, I think, well, they, I, they're, <clears throat> they're essential for a few reasons. One, and we talked about this on the show, is accessibility. You know, there are differently abled players who are going to need alternative forms of controllers and interfaces to take part. Um, PlayStation Move did that to an extent. Microsoft Connect did that to an extent. And so that was an early way to give players different ways to interface. Beyond that, though, <clears throat> some of the games for the PlayStation, for example, that use, you know, the, the two hand controllers have been a lot of fun. There was a PlayStation VR game called Archangel, I think it was something angel where you're basically like fighting in this Pacific Rim type robot. And the fact that you don't have a controller in your hand, but you have these two control sticks, one in either hand made the game super fun to play. Cause it was like, you were in this machine aiming the hands of this robot and firing away. So it just gives you this flexibility of experiences that I think gamers should be able to demand. But then again, you know, go back to the early days of gaming. That's nothing new. Remember, the controller for Pong was a dial. Remember Arkanoid? The controller was a dial. There were plenty of video game systems where originally, if you were going to get a ColecoVision versus a Commodore 64 versus an Atari, you decided whether you wanted a joystick, a dial, a keypad, a touchpad. Like, Controllers have always varied 
you know, Nintendo has done plenty with with you know guns, controllers, and the little robot that had the the spinning top on it that did something. I don't know what it did, but they sold it. And <laughs> it's always been this effort to try to give you different ways to touch the game. And I don't see how we can go back from that. But it's also it's also not new. It's kind of one of those things that games were always working their way toward they haven't quite reached that singularity yet but they're they're a hell of a lot closer than they used to be and and if it's done right it doesn't feel gratuitous or gimmicky it feels like oh i can't imagine playing this game any other way it's to the point where there are some games where i wish they had the option to play it with different kinds of controllers because if i could just finesse it with my body rather than my thumbs i'd have a better playing experience i'd have better control of it for sure and it's almost kind of like an inverse proportional relationship when sometimes the stranger or more interesting the medium of connecting to the game sometimes the more organic it can feel and you can connect on a level you may yeah. have not been able to normally yeah and it, it it's also you know i mean granted there are some games where you don't really need it but then on the games where you do it makes a it makes a difference even detroit become human you know there are certain scenes where you know it's a chase or you know it's a fight and you have to hit a certain button at a certain time spider-man does the same thing and you know being able to be in a game where you think you're just going from decision gate to decision gate and it suddenly becomes a game where you need hand-eye coordination and reaction time matters it kind of adds to the thrill of the game in a way it kind of puts you on your <clears throat> on your metal in a different way and it makes you kind of lean forward like when when there was a when i found this chase scene in detroit become human one of the reasons why i kept getting connor killed that's another conversation <laughs> but i did i wasn't ready for that moment i had leaned back away from the game and it was one of those moments where i was like oh okay i cannot do that i have to pay closer attention and it immediately made the game more compelling for me because it threw me a curve and the more different ways you can play the more ways you have to make a game engrossing great point uh here's uh we're gonna the last little part of the show here uh we'll throw to the community because one of the things i absolutely love about this profession being able to stream on twitch is the fact that this medium is not just all about me or who's on the channel it's it's about the interaction the community values and everything we're doing so i thought for the last little bit we could take some questions from our audience so the first sure. question i have here is from mike sch87 he says what game do you look forward to the most and why is it cyberpunk 27 wait a second um <laughs> oh you smart alecky kid you uh, okay i just got got uh well let's let's actually uh -huh. make that a real question do you have any games on the horizon that you are very much looking forward to well, Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> looks pretty good. I got to I think we got a winner here, chat. <laughs> there you go. And actually, I got to say Cyberpunk 2077 for the first time I saw kind of the, you know, that the early playthrough that long 45-minute video they released looks pretty awesome. I mean, I before I, I was a fan of Cyberpunk 2077 before Keanu Reeves, okay? But it, just the fact that it was this super immersive like gigantic open world looked very seamless in terms of not having to kind of load from experience to experience to pause the game if that's the way the final game engine looks seemed pretty awesome just to kind of be in that space and i think one of the things that you know you asked me about my favorite games one of the things that i really enjoy about spider-man for example is that you're just kind of in new york and you don't really have to you know chase down dr octopus if you don't feel like it you can just kind of be in new york which you know, there are some days when I don't feel like going after the big mission. I just want to kind of like float around and beat up bad guys as I find them. So I'm getting more interested in those big immersive open world games. Um, there are a few games that are out that I, I'm trying to make time to get back to playing. Um, I've seen some videos of A Plague Tale, which looks in interesting to me, but right. I'm not really interested in having nightmares about rats. So I'm going to have to work my way up to that one. But primarily, I think Cyberpunk 2077, despite the fact that it was an entirely leading question. <laughs> I, I have no clue what you're referring to. And uh, oh, if you think the rats are bad, just wait till the rat NATOs. But we can talk about that a little later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Is, is that a movie on sci-fi? <laughs> I know, right? You'd think so. You'd think so. Um, so another question from chat, big thank you to Silent for this. Um, he says, do you think game mode has opened up any new pathways in terms of reporting and gaming? 
pro- hopefully for us, I mean, you know, we we want to keep doing shows on gaming. So Paige Osborne, our producer here at 1A, is still working on additional shows. Like I said, we want more of your ideas. Go to the1a.org and click on Ask 1A for instructions on how to send us ideas. You could also just email us, 1A at W-A-M-U dot O-R-G. But hopefully it will. I hope that, and you know, we are distributed by NPR. We don't work for NPR. We work for a local station. I hope that NPR kind of gets on that bandwagon. I hope that people who listen to this into the series will send a little note to their NPR member station and say, hey, that that series game mode on 1A was really awesome. I hope that you air more things like that. Because stations really do literally have all the power in the NPR ecosystem. And if more of our listeners demand it. If our listeners lean forward on their stations, the station will lean on the network and the network will tell us. So it kind of is very audience driven, I think, in a way that we don't really talk about nearly enough. But yeah, it can be done if we can substantiate there is an audience for this. They have demanded this. We can write a grant. We can go get an underwriter. We can build it into our budget when we fundraise. That's the way that a lot of things often happen. And if we can do enough of that, then it doesn't have to be, you know, a one-off. It doesn't have to be this grant-funded thing where we cross our fingers that we can get the grant renewed. We can just make it part of our regular coverage. And that doesn't replace the polygons and the katakus of the world, but it, it gives you another venue to kind of do deeper dive, longer conversation with a different kind of audience. It's, it's funny, you know, the, the people who listen to WAMU here in Washington are representing all 635 members of Congress, every division of the United States government. They work for the Supreme Court. They work for every think tank across the political aisle. So when you are on WAMU, you are literally speaking to all of official Washington, including the contractors who live in Northern Virginia, the research facilities that are in Southern Maryland, you're speaking to the entire official infrastructure of the United States government. And so now there are people who work for the US government who are aware of gaming in a different way. I mean, that's the impact of it. And stations allow us to have the platform to have that kind of impact. So the knock on effect from just contacting your station and saying, hey, this is the kind of thing I like, I would like more of it. The knock on effect from that is gigantic for sure that is that is mind-blowing in scope uh and it's it's very cool to think that 1a is kind of acting in in many ways as a catalyst to kind of pull these two worlds together in a form where they may not be able to and also touching back on on the other things it's it's a completely different feeling because you know i'm somebody who's saturated in gaming news and gaming culture all the time and it's a completely different feeling reading a polygon or kotaku article but then listening to an actual discussion something kind of unfolding organically around gaming, what it is, the people that are actually in the industry. Like you had the World of Warcraft director on, and that was that was extremely interesting to me as somebody who had never actually heard him discuss his views and feelings on on what he's been doing with all of that. So very cool stuff. Yeah, and it's and it's also, you know, because of the nature of our audience, we have to be a little bit more general interest. You know, we have to do a little more, I hate to use the term hand holding, but a little bit more explaining. Because we know that there are people in our audience who are brand new to having these conversations about gaming. We know there are people like the folks in your audience who are steeped in gaming and everything in between. So part of the challenge and opportunity of the kind of show like we do is that we have to serve everybody all the time, everywhere at once and figure out how to tell a story that is accessible for newcomers, but that doesn't feel facile and rudimentary for people who are really steeped so that they share what they know and that newcomers can get their questions answered. It's that kind of magic middle that public radio can serve that allows everyone to kind of come to the conversation with whatever they have and be validated for that. For sure, for sure. Well, Joshua, this has been, an incredibly fast feeling interview. I, I could literally talk to you for hours. This has been absolutely <laughs> awesome. I know you've got a lot to do. We've, we've just come up on our limit. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, throw a title screen up with your information. If you wanna let folks know where cool. they can find you, what you do, uh, talk about 1A, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, again, just thank you so much for your time and I'll kick it over to you right now. 
Yes, the first thing I would encourage you to do is to find your NPR member station wherever you live. See if they air 1A. If they do, please listen. Please support it. If you like 1A, let the station know that you like the program. They need to hear from you. If they don't air it, let them know that you'd like to hear it and tell them why. If it was game mode, if it's the Friday News Roundup, if it's something else that we've done. We did an entire series in May on motherhood. We extended Mother's Day to a week. Maybe it's one of our special series or our series of interviews with the Democratic presidential primary candidates called Foresight 2020. Whatever it is that you like, number one thing, tell your local station because stations have the power in the system. As it relates to game mode, go to the 1A, that's the word, the, the number one, the letter A, dot org, slash game mode, all one word, and you can check out all the stories in our series. At the top of the page, if you click Ask 1A, there's all the information on how to reach us, not just for stories on gaming, but on anything in your community that might be of interest that you think deserves a national look, or any stories that you would just like to hear more about. Or if you'd like to share your story with us about a story in the news, that'll give you all the information on how to do that. Also check out our series 1A Across America, which is our run up to the 2020 election, more local coverage. And just be in touch. You know, let us know if you hear something that you like or if you have a question or tune in during the show and throw in your thoughts or your questions. But the most important thing you can do is engage with your local NPR member station. If we are the reason that you start listening, that's awesome. If you listen to the station and you're not quite hearing what you want to hear, let them know. But this is like gaming in a way. It's a community that's driven by the audience. If a game doesn't have an audience, it is a failure and it can't perpetuate. Same thing with public radio. If we don't have an audience that engages, that tells us what works, what doesn't work, then we have failed. So you as gamers already know exactly how to do this kind of engagement. You're probably better at it than anybody. So just take that exact same skill set, that exact same engagement, that exact same connection and interest, and just shift it over to this medium and we will be the better for it. Well, again, I, I can't thank you enough for being here, Josh. It has been a pleasure talking to you. And, uh, well, hopefully our paths will cross at some point in the future. Thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, my friends. Well, I really hope that you guys enjoyed that. That was amazing. He, he's, he's such a well-spoken, great guy. And like, like he said multiple times, the best thing you guys can do if, if you enjoy that kind of journalism is just be an active participant. Uh, follow 1A on Twitter. They are at the number one at uh, A. They have tons of interesting stuff on their website. You can check out, you can listen to yourself. And of course, they're on many, many NPR stations across the United States. You can check your local channels for listings. And uh, yeah, it was really, really good. 